you both. So now to the um, privilege that we have of uh, introducing our speaker this morning, Bishop Janice Huey. As I don't remember how many years ago, it was a few more than several, that uh, Bishop Huey was one of the presenters at uh, annual conference. And as I sat and listened to her, I couldn't take notes fast enough for all of the wonderful information regarding leadership that she was sharing with our annual conference that year. And that, that was the first time I had really heard her speak and uh, just gleaned so much from it. When we had the opportunity to think about the possibility of her coming, I thought, would she really come to Florida, to the North Central District, and talk to us? And by golly, she did. She said she would be glad to come. So Bishop Huey is a retired bishop of the United Methodist Church. Uh, she served in the um, Arkansas Conference as well as the Texas Annual Conference. Uh, she's a former president of the Council of Bishops, of which our own bishop, Bishop Carter, is finishing up his two-year term as president of the Council of Bishops. Um, so she has both, a, she served in local churches, she has a, a local church perspective, um, an annual conference perspective, and a global denominational perspective of her experience that she brings to us today, and I'm so grateful for it. In her retirement as a bishop, she now serves with the Texas Methodist Foundation in the area of leadership formation, and we are grateful for the wonderful work that she is doing through that foundation. Uh, so we, she lives on the family farm in Beeville, Texas, right? And uh, where her son uh, helps uh, farm and, and direct uh, the work there uh, that, where they live, and it's the farm where she grew up. So she also knows about rural churches and rural church ministry. So she comes with the fullness of experience of one that can share with us about the unique time that we find ourselves um, not only in the church but in history. Okay, things are, anybody notice that things are kind of shifting and changing? You want to raise your hand if you're noticing something about that? And we need to begin thinking about number one, own it, name it, own it, and then what do we do about it? Because we in the church are challenged to be able to respond in a way that we know will be meaningful, life-changing, faithful, to, be, to continue to do the work we're being called to do as local church leaders, pastors, and as congregations. So we are grateful to have Bishop Huey here this morning, and I invite her to come and, and share with us as she opens us up with some words of grace and devotion. Would you please welcome her? Thank you, thank you, thank you. Well, good morning, friends. Um, let me just say, it's a joy for me to be here with you um, today. This is not my first trip to this district because you guys are cutting edge for the denomination. You might not think that, but you are. And um, several, I guess it's been a year and a half ago, uh, my colleague Lisa Greenwood and I, we both work for TMF. Um, she's a pastor. And we were looking around is where are new things um, um, where's people trying to innovate and think about how to reach new people with the gospel? Um, and as we looked around the United States, we kept, in the first instance, coming back to Florida. Florida, Florida, Florida. And, um, and then when we looked more specifically and talked, um, had conversations with your bishop and with June and with Michael, um, so we um, came and spent a day and a half driving around this district and being um, participating in um, some of the fresh expressions that are going on, but singing. Um, it's been my thought for uh, several years now that Florida and Texas, of two conferences that are similar, um, these two are. I mean, they're both on the Gulf of Mexico. They're both, they both have a lot of large churches, and then they also have a lot and lot of rural areas. The state of Texas has 254 counties, and probably 200 of those are rural counties. So, I mean, there's, and, and I mean, it's also got large cities. So anyway, there's lots going on. I'm so appreciative of your willingness to try new things, to learn, 
I mean, clearly you're a learning district and you want to learn more. So um, having, uh, it's just a pleasure for me to, I, I, I bet you I'll learn more today than I'll teach, but we'll, we'll give this a try here. Um, so I want to start out this morning um, just thinking about the why, the why we do what we do. What's the ground the theological, biblical God space that we stand on before we do any of these other things we'll do later today. And I'll I'll tell you one of the ways that came to me recently um, was with a question um, posed to me a couple of weeks ago by a dear friend of mine. Um, And she really caught me off guard with her question My friend Kay is a lifelong United Methodist. Her parents were Methodist. Her grandparents were Methodist. Their children and their grandchildren are Methodist. And as far as I know, that family might go all the way back to John Wesley. But what's a lot more important than her affiliation, in my judgment, is that her character, her being, has been formed and shaped through the years by an understanding of prevenient grace and justifying grace and sanctifying grace and um, in becoming more perfect in love in this life. Um, Her family um, and she herself, I mean, they're a family that's been blessed financially, but they've been for decades wonderfully generous um, with their time, their talents, their financial gifts, and they do that in their local church, they do that at the annual conference and beyond. So anyway, we are sitting, talking. Um, she lives um, in a rural county um, we were, and goes to a county seat church. We are talking about all that and the struggles that lots of rural churches are having. having. We were talking about the upcoming general conference and all the um, whitewater that's going on in the United Methodist Church. And then suddenly she got really serious and looked me straight in the eye and said to me, Janice, um, I know you'll be honest with me. Are you really optimistic about the future of the United Methodist Church? Um, and I will say the silence seemed a little endless as I prayed for the right words to speak. And I finally said this to her and will say to you, um, I don't know that optimism is the right word for how I see the future of the United Methodist Church especially as we have known it in our lifetime. Um, But I want you to know, Kay, that I am hopeful. I am very, very hopeful for the future of the United Methodist Church. And not because people like you and me get it right, but because the church belongs to God. The church is the body of Christ. And the body of Christ is a resurrected body. And so I believe in a God who makes a way out of no way. Um, I believe that ultimately the future of the United Methodist Church doesn't depend on us. It depends on God and God can be trusted. Um, God can be trusted to make all things new. So we're going to talk today about how you lead in times like these, which are uncertain, and there's a lot of, you know, whitewater going on. Um, and, and we're going to talk about the courage and the freedom and um, the possibilities to innovate and to try new things. Um, and, but I wanted to say to you right here at the beginning, what it is that makes me tick and why I would come to make a second trip to your district and learn from you and be with you together. So my friend Kay asked me if I was optimistic. 
See, I want to say this morning before we get into the rest that I believe that hope and optimism are two different things. You've heard that before in some sermon. I know you have. Um, Optimism is based on external circumstances. Um, The optimist looks out here at the world, and um, if things are going good, then they feel good. Um, Things are looking up, then the optimist says everything's going to be okay. But what happens when everything is not okay? (laughs) When things are not right? when they're not turning out like you wanted them to turn out, when a congregation can no longer afford a full-time pastor or even a part-time pastor, or when the saints are too old or too tired or too sick to meet new neighbors in the community. That's when optimism can turn to pessimism on a dime. Um, But the New Testament and the Old Testament tell us that hope is different than that. Hope is not dependent on the external circumstance. In the scriptures, what we see is that hope is often a choice. We deliberately decide that we are hopeful people even when times are dark. Um, Hope is not about a feeling. I mean, it can feel good, but that's not its foundation. Um, Hope is built on faith. Faith in Jesus Christ, faith in God made known and empowered by the Holy Spirit, faith in the one who made the world and who's called us to be God's people. And so it's faith in that God that gives us the courage and the energy, the vitality to kind of pick things up and get going again. That's why we speak about hope sometimes um, as a virtue. So just for a moment here, just think with me about what you know from the Bible about hope. Okay, start with the book of Genesis. The book of Genesis tells us about a dove flying back to the ark with a sprig of hope in her beak. Um, It tells us about Abraham and Sarah meeting hope disguised as three strangers. Um, It tells us in the book of Isaiah about a lion and a lamb lying down together. Remember that? About water flowing in a desert, about a valley lifted up, about a shoot coming forth from a long forgotten stump. And then think about the book of Jeremiah. Um, The prophet Jeremiah tells a bunch of beaten down refugees to pick themselves up and build houses and plant gardens and have children because after all, God has got plans for you. And you remember the line, and a future with hope. Um, And and then, of course, there's Ezekiel. We're just still in the Old Testament and I'm skipping over a hundred others. You remember all the dry bones out on the plains? Um, And God tells Ezekiel to prophesy. And he prophesies, he does what God asked him to do, and the bones come together, and he says, prophesy again, and there, there's sinew, and there's muscle on the bones, and he says, prophesy again, and call the wind to come, and it breathes on the bones, and they stand up and live. That's our story, friends. That's our story. Um, And so Jesus came along and preached the good news where hope reigns supreme. He talked about a kingdom of peace, a kingdom of justice, a kingdom of mercy, a kingdom where people like us, who might otherwise not ever be sitting in the same room, come together and love one another and forgive one another, um, not one time, but 70 times seven you and I get to talk about and help people experience a world where the blind see and the deaf hear and the sick are cured. It's a world where leaders stoop down and wash the feet of those who follow them. And maybe as important as anything, Jesus taught his followers a prayer that we say every single day. Thy kingdom come on earth 
as it is in heaven. Did you notice in the scripture there's, there's, there's no explanation for all these promises that God makes to us? There's just the kind of understanding God's going to do what God said God's going to do. And so we hope. And hope is the ground um, of all these actions that come be toward us. See, I'm, I'm getting all the way. I'm over in the New Testament now, so one more here. In writing his letter to the church at Rome, the Apostle Paul knows the scriptures, and so he's like painting on this cosmic canvas of God's salvation history, what God has done over thousands of years. And the focal point for the Apostle Paul is the resurrection of Jesus because he knows that resurrection hope transforms lives and transformed lives like yours and mine, pray God, we transform the world. Um, So um, Paul says hope that is seen is not hope for who hopes for what he sees. But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. It is in this hope that we're saved. Dr. Eugene Peterson says it this way, the resurrection life we receive from God is not a timid, grave-tending life. I like that. Um, It is adventurous. It's expectant. It greets God with a childlike um, expression that says, hey, what's next, Papa? And the moment we get tired and worn out with trying something and then it didn't work and we try something else and it didn't work, we can be sure that God's spirit is right along beside us saying, hey, it'll be all right. You're going to try again. You're going to try again. And and that's why um, we can be sure that every detail of our lives of love for God, even the failures, it's being worked into something good and something holy. And that's how we find the courage and the joy and the love to sort of pick ourselves up um, and go on. So three weeks ago, um, I traveled to Los Angeles, um, part of my TMF leadership work with a group of 18 United Methodist pastors um, that we are um, hoping will learn to be even more courageous than they already are. Um, to learn about some innovative ministries going on there. Um, So we went, I was telling Michael and June about this yesterday, we visited Homeboy Industries, Homeboy Industries, which is now the most, um, the largest and the most successful gang intervention ministry in the world. Um, it's just amazing. It's, it's older now. It's, it's been going on about um, 25 or 30 years. Um, they serve about 10,000 young, mostly young men, some women, um, a month. Think about that. Um, and, um, and the way that they've done that um, is the Jesuits, Father Boyle and the others, about five Jesuits, they have created and over time developed among these gang members, former gang members, Christian community. Um, it's, I mean, I thought I was going to see a social service agency. What I saw was church. Uh, it doesn't look like anything I've ever been in before. Now, let me just tell you that. Um, not in the slightest. Um, but that's what it was. And that's the language they spoke. The language of God's beloved the language of love, the language of forgiveness, and uh, most especially the language of mercy. Um, And then we moved from there and went over to St. Mary's Episcopal Church. Um, That church is about 100 years old. Um, It's now home to three congregations. Um, The first congregation um, is five 85 and 95-year-old Japanese immigrant women. And they were the original congregation for that church. And there are five of them left. And they, every Sunday morning at 8.30, there's church for them um, on Sunday morning. And then at 9.45, there's the second congregation that 
uh, meets there. It's mostly Anglo. These are the people who moved into the community after um, more of the Japanese um, community moved out into other parts of California. Um, there are probably, um, the priest told us about, about 35 of those saints. Mostly they're baby boomers like me um, and looking out there like a bunch of you. Um, so kind of my generation. And then about nine years ago, some folks from Mexico, from um, the area of Oaxaca in northern Mexico, Zapotecs, um, knocked on their door and said, you know, we've, um, we've been looking, we've got lots of children here. We're scattered out in this community and we could, we, we would rent. Um, we can't pay much, but do you have a space that we could come once a week, bring our kids and help them connect to each other? And, and so the priest at that time said, well, of course. And today at one o'clock on Sunday, about 130 Zapotecs filled with children um, and young adults um, meet in that Episcopal church. They used to be Catholic, but that wasn't a Catholic church. It's Episcopal church. It, they used to have a man for a priest, but Mother Anne, they call her, um, is the priest um, there, and that's who's there. Um, it serves them all. Um, all that's done with a part-time pastor um, and, um, and trying to figure out new ways to fund to have a business plan to keep the church moving forward to serve this very diverse community. And the last place we visited was a Methodist church. It was First United Methodist Church in Los Angeles. Um, once upon a time, that church was so large that it covered a full half block in downtown Los Angeles. But as the congregation declined over the years, I mean, who wanted to drive downtown, um, to go to church with all the traffic issues around in Los Angeles, the church just in an effort to keep going just sold off more and more and more of its property. So what they have left today is an asphalt parking lot, about 50 spaces. There's nothing on it except asphalt parking lot, striped, about 50 spaces. There's not even a restroom. And so the church now leases out the asphalt parking lot six days a week, which provides enough income to pay for, it has a pastor now, the parking lot has a pastor. Um, actually, the pastor is less to the parking lot and more there's low income housing um, all around there. They're not too far from Skid Row. Um, and now they have a worship service on Sunday morning. They set up a tent, um, they have musicians. Um, there's a pastor who's connecting with these folk who, um, you know, live in apartments um, in the neighborhood. And here's the most important thing I saw about that parking lot. There's hope. There's hope. There's hope in the form of um, a pastor and now a congregation slowly building. It's not optimism because I'm telling you, it's asphalt. Um, <laughs> Um, but it is hope. There's hope that God's going to do something new in this downtown community. It's the kind of hope that depends on God and God's faithfulness. It's the hope in a God who doesn't quit. And it's trust in God's promises that there will be something new despite all the circumstances. So, friends, that's the hope. Um, with, that's what I believe. That's why I'm here. I think that's what you believe, too. <laughs> And that might be why you're here. And together we're going to work at saying, how can we move out and um, bring the gospel of Jesus Christ in ways that, new ways that can be heard, not just by us who are blessed, but by the world out there. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So again, um, thank you all um, for being here. So let's see, let me get my little clicker here. All right, now I know you showed me how to do this. Like, where's the switch? It should be on? All right, let's try that. Oh, look at that. Okay, well, I must have gone. Let's go back here to session. Look at that.
All right, we're in business. All right. So um, I want to talk right now for just a minute about um, how the world has changed. Um, as I said earlier, this is not an easy time to be a leader in the United Methodist Church. And um, where we are now, um, it's been described in a number of ways. Um, you know, we talk about in between times. Another descriptive phrase is a threshold time, you know, thresholds like walking from one room into another or walking from outside to the inside. Or another image that's been used is a liminal season. Again, it's that kind of in-between space. So it's a time that we live in. It's a time between what has been and in some ways, you know, what we know and are familiar with and what will be that we haven't yet seen. Um, you know, for uh, many of us, um, it's a time between the St. Louis General Conference and the Minneapolis General Conference. Um, like, um, at least in my mind, the Israelites journeying in the wilderness, I think God is birthing something new in the United Methodist Church, but we're not there yet. Um, and we don't know what that's going to be and how it's going to look. Um, and so we have to think about in uncertain times like this, how are we, you, me, all of us, how do we lead? How are we called to lead? Um, you know, I've had some lay people who've said, you know, this feels like, you know, Israel's wandering in the wilderness. And that may be some ways in which it does feel like wandering in the wilderness. But the good news about that, it, even if it was 40 years long, there was a promised land and they did get over there taking with them what they had learned um, while they were out in the, in the wilderness. So what I believe is that God has put the people called Methodist right here in this North Central District of the Florida Annual Conference for some purpose brand new purpose in this decade, and it'll be God's purpose. So there are three central questions, I think, that are important for leaders today. Um, now, let's see, there they are. Um, I think they're these questions. Who are you? That, that is to be really clear about who, and when I say you, I mean it at two levels. One, is you as a disciple of Jesus Christ. Okay, so that's an individual you and you as your congregation. So when we say, who are you now? Think about, you know, what is your vocation as a disciple of Jesus Christ? But then collectively, as you're sitting here, most of you in tables where it's your congregation, um, who are you now? Um, as a congregation, and then what do you need to learn? What's really critical for yourself, for your congregation, what do you need? These are all questions of identity. Um, so the second question and area for leaders today is who are your neighbors now? Um, and this is one of the things that is hanging up lots of congregations is trying to reconnect with their neighbors. Um, and it's one of the wonderful gifts that Fresh Expressions has brought to us, is helping us discover and learn about people that maybe to us previously were invisible in the community. We just, we might drive past every day, but we never saw them. Um, and so it's learning to see who are our neighbors now. That's the question of context. Um, we'll come back to all this. We're, I mean, there'll be more on this. I just want you to see kind of at the, here at the beginning sort of where we're going. And then um, the third question has to do with purpose. And that is, what is the difference that God is calling you to make in your context now? What is the difference that God is not the difference you want to make or this, what difference? This is a discernment question. You have to think about what is God calling us 
What difference is God calling us to make in this context now? Here's another way to, here's another way to do the question. Um, if your congregation, or if you as an individual disciple of Jesus, could do just one thing to make your community look more like God's reign on earth as it is in heaven, what would that be? If you would do just one thing to make your community, I'm not talking about necessarily your church, although that could be part of it, but if you could do one thing to make your community look more like God's reign on earth as it is in heaven, what would you do? Um, that's the question of purpose that God is calling you to make. So I want to take just a moment here. On your tables, there's some post-it notes and there's some like big pieces of paper, print paper. Everybody take two or three post-it notes here. Um, and um, I want you to write just a word or a phrase. What do you want to learn today? What do you hope to learn today? Or another way to phrase the question is, this gathering would be a success if I learned and you fill in the blank. Okay, so I'm asking you, what do you want to learn? You've invested, are investing lots of time, energy to be here today. What do you want to learn? What's important for you to learn um, to be here today? Just, just do this in like one or two minutes. What do you want to learn? Okay, you got it? Now, I'm going to take about two minutes, and y'all just tell each other around the table. Talk to each other in your church. Share with each other. Put your post-it note on the, stick it on the, one of these um, larger pieces of paper, um, and then tell your neighbors and um, your church colleagues what it is you want to learn. Okay, well, okay, that's great. We'll, we'll make it. Okay, great, thanks. Thanks, thanks. Okay, you got it? All right, we'll come back around. We'll come back around um, to be continued. So my colleague, um, Dr. Gil Rindle, um, reminds us that the more complex a society becomes, the more sophisticated leadership has to become. 
And um, so I'm going to try here to tell us, um, here's four things I was hoping will happen today. So it kind of gives you a little roadmap into where we're going. One, I hope that every one of you will become, um, and your congregations, your leadership group from your congregation, become clearer about your purpose. Um, I hope you leave here feeling like more capacity for courage, like, okay, we can, we can try this. We can try this. Uh, at TMF, we say, fail fast, fail often. So we're just, you know, again, trying to, it's really hard to, you know, kind of get up and go. Um, three is to be more resilient. That also goes in with fail fast, fail often. And four is that by the time you leave here this afternoon, you around these tables are going to have a next step in your mind um, and you're going to do it. So this is kind of a move to action. Are you with me? Um, so we're going to do here, we're, uh, we're going to start this out um, um, with a fun thing. So look at this photo. All right. Anybody guess what it is? Look at the date. It's a big hint. Exactly 15 years ago now, um, Benedict was elected Pope. Um, and so what you see here is a photo of St. Peter's Square on the evening that his election was announced and he came out to give the papal blessings. He, look at the crowd. Just kind of see, what do you notice here? I mean, there are people all over the world who are waiting for the news. Who's it going to be? Who's it going to be? There were print reporters, broadcast reporters, uh, television cameras. They were sending images. Um, lots of photos. The Vatican itself was gathering data to put out an authorized version of what just happened. Here, the information's very top down. So, as you may know, Pope Benedict retired just eight years later in 2013. So that's seven years ago from where we're standing today. And a new Pope was elected, Pope Francis. So I'm gonna show you the very same shot, same camera angle from eight years later, all right? And you tell me what's different. Amazing, isn't it? Everybody's got a smartphone. Everybody's taking photos. Um, each, so who are the reporters now? Everybody, everybody. Um, and, um, you know, are they sending out um, um, big, long reports? Or are they just, I mean, they're on social media? Um, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn. I mean, there's a zillion platforms. Um, everybody's got a smartphone. Who's controlling the narrative? Is it the Vatican? No way. <laughs> um, and everybody is speaking individually um, about their experience um, all over the world. I'll do one more kind of fun one here. Look at that. Look at the difference between 2007 and 2019. Um, with this new phone, um, individuals are now um, capable of taking high quality video and audio to film and report everything from an incident involving um, a police officer to what's happening on the border of Texas to a hospital being bombed in Idlib, Iraq, to the most recent school shooting. And the same social media apps that all that's going out on and have the capacity for Amazon to deliver everything you ordered to your door in time for Christmas also has the capacity to interfere with elections all around the world. Um, and now this new iPhone, the old one wouldn't do it, but the new iPhone connects to an Apple Watch, which my husband has one of, um, which in the next decade will be ramped up by artificial intelligence and that there will be another explosion of knowledge and change in ways that none of us right now can even imagine. Um, I offer that to just say something about the rate of change going on external to us 
which even if you're kind of slow to get into all these things, which I am, and this is hard for me because I'm a baby boomer and this is not my first language, but it's happening anyway. And um, it says something about um, the unpredictability of change, the complexity of change. And this has changed. Some of the change is positive, some of the change is negative, but it just is. It just is. And along with all this technical change, there's many, many other changes going on around us. I mean, in the United States, you probably know that we, we've had for the last several years a decrease in life expectancy. Um, and actually, this last year, it went up by one month, which is not as good as it was four years ago, but it's, it, it's better. And that the biggest driver on those deaths um, and this is new for the U.S. I mean, for since the beginning of our country, every year we got better on life expectancy. Um, but it's being driven in part by what people are calling deaths of despair. Um, suicides, opioid use, addiction, and an increase in infant mortality. You know, if, if the gospel doesn't have something to say to that, um, I just can't imagine more. Um, so the first task of a leader is to paint an accurate picture of reality. Because if you don't know where you are, you don't know where you're going to go. Um, and there are a lot of ways that people are talking about describing this new reality. So um, you can read about that in a number. But I, I'm going to, I want to just go through in this first section, I'm going to just as quickly as I can describe four trends happening in the culture that I think are significantly affecting the United Methodist Church. Um, and one of the most helpful um, discussion uh, descriptions comes from my friend Gil Rendell, who's one of a colleague at TMF. Um, and he talks about the shift from a convergent culture to a divergent culture. That's, that's the first trend, convergent to divergent. Um, most of us in this room today, um, kind of looking out here, grew up in a convergent world. Um, I, I put the little pendulum point in the middle, which says something about where I would like to see things. <laughs> but um, but if, if we grew up in a we, those of us that grew up in a convergent world, um, it, people kind of led with their sameness, their similarity, and the focus was on the community. Um, it, a, it, there was a general agreement, a, consistent, a, a, a consensus in the culture about a lot of issues. Um, questions and answers are mostly the same for most people. And it's kind of like asking the question, you know, how, what's the shortest distance from here to Lakeland? Well, that seems like a pretty simple question. And we could say, you know, how many miles it is. And there's just one answer to that. That's a right answer. Um, but when we get over to divergence, I'll show you how that works. You know, it has a different valence on it. In a convergent culture, the, a key word is we, we. Um, we do this in our church, we do that in our city, we do that in our community. Um, the problem with this, um, with the we, is that when we push it all together and think about a melting pot, not everybody fits that. Um, there's huge differences and increasing differences. So in a divergent culture, see over there on the other side, People lead with their differences. Um, the focus is on individual preferences. What do I want? What do I need? And the questions and the answers are different for different people. And so if we're talking about going to Lakeland, the question in a divergent culture might be, why do you want to go to Lakeland? Um, what do you need in Lakeland? Um, where in Lakeland do you want to go? Did you plan to stop at a restaurant along the way? See, there's, there's not a right or wrong about that. It's just descriptive. Um, and um, it depends on the context. That's why I had context up there a little earlier. Depends on the circumstance. But a key word 
in divergent is the word I, I. So it's not a melting pot. It's a stew with lots of chunks of meat and various vegetables in it. So you see the differences in people. And the difference between these two things is part of the challenge of leadership today, particularly in the United Methodist Church. We were formed as a denomination in a convergent time, 1968, um, when we all wanted to come together. We are living, again, think about the culture, in a culture now which everybody wants to do their own thing. So if you're way over here on the left-hand side of convergence, then it's like we start thinking that everybody's alike, which they're not. Um, but if we get too far over there on divergent, then it's all about me and what I want, and you get this splintering. Um, and we'll say some more about some of that um, later. Convergence is certain. Um, divergence takes certainty away. Convergence is based on kind of a, you know, a, a sense that um, there's, there's high institutional trust. People want to be with other people. They want to join. I mean, those are sort of the heyday for the United Methodist Church. Um, when people lead with their similarities in a convergent culture, folks around them would say, oh, yeah, I understand that. Um, I know what you're talking about. But in a divergent time, they would say, that might apply to you, but it doesn't apply to me. Um, and so divergence is, you know, that you've got to be willing to have multiple answers to a situation and recognize that differences are important. So here's how it applies to the UMC. 40 years ago, um, there was a general consensus in the United Methodist Church that all pastors were men. There was a consensus out in the larger culture that um, almost everybody in the city or county or area was religious and, you know, everybody was going to go to church somewhere. And if you remember a time like that, remember I grew up in a rural area and everybody, I mean, there was this expectation. I mean, everybody went to church on Sunday. There was a consensus even when I was a young pastor in a rural area that Wednesday nights were church nights. Anybody remember those days? Um, there was a consensus that um, in the culture that you wouldn't schedule um, sports activities on Sunday mornings. Anybody remember that? Um, there was also consensus that marriage was between a man and a woman. There was a consensus and the general assumptions that in my area that Anglos and Hispanics, that they preferred to wor worship in their own distinctive ethnic congregations. That at least is what we thought. Um, so this first trend that I want am pointing to is this shift that's being made between the early part of the 20th century, um, some would say up until about the 1960s, was a convergent time. And the, the country was bonded by World War II, the Great Depression. Um, people believed that, quote, we're all in this together. And the focus then was on the group, the community. There was a large middle class, trust in institutions was high, mainline Protestantism, especially Methodist. We flourished in that season. Um, you know, I think about something I heard from my dad um, growing up over and over again. What's good for the community is good for us. That's the world of convergence. Um, and in 1968, when the Methodist Church and the Evangelical Church joined together to create the UMC, our focus was on, hey, come, come, come and be a part of our church family. And when the pastor turned in the year-end report, what was the most important number? It was membership. That's what, you, that's what made sense in a convergent culture is how many people joined. Um, and we built thousands of churches most charitable giving went to faith institutions, usually a church. And United Methodist pastors were trained to take care of the people who were already here. That's what we told, taught them to do. And that's what SPR committees expected them to do. 
And many of our leaders today are from that generation. And so when we look at the average age in our congregations and we see all the people who are nurtured in that area, um, it's no wonder that we're still in many ways trying to operate out of convergence in a very divergent culture. I mean, look at us here. This is an exercise in convergence. And it's good. It's good. Um, there are a lot of gifts in convergence, mutual support, sharing of resources, the strong and the weak work together, building great institutions. What Methodists call connection is undergirded and supported by convergence. And it's why now that we're in a divergent culture, we're having so much challenge around supporting connection. But here are the liabilities. We don't always see people who are different than we are, such as persons of color, they become invisible. Persons with low income, they're invisible. LBGD um, persons, they're invisible. People who live across the tracks, whatever's the metaphor for that in your community. People who have a different age or different points of view. Um, we, don't, we tend not to see them. Um, so this shift to divergence, which began in the last quarter of the 20th century, what happened is that people stepped forward and they said, I'm different and I'm good. Um, and so diversity, um, uh, divergence celebrates diversity. It honors differences. It lifts up the voices and the convictions of people who feel oppressed or suppressed. Um, and if you think about the last part of the 20th century, you know, think about black power movement, think about women's movement, gay pride movement, La Raza, farm workers movement, all these things were efforts of saying, look, we're here and we're part of this world too, uh, and we matter. Um, but then in this century, the 21st century, these differences have given, been given new energy by the changes in technology that I put up there a little earlier. So now think Black Lives Matter, Me Too, LGBT, Occupy Wall Street, and these voices around said, hey, I'm important too, and there's this new urgency and new connection that's electronic um, and uses that. At its most extreme, people break into smaller and smaller fragments and the culture becomes more and more polarized. And some of you might say, I would, that we're living in a highly polarized culture right now. Um, which is why, you know, this is my bias for where we need to be moving to is to draw on the strengths of both convergence and divergence um, as we move forward. Um, so here's what's, um, um, so um, when you think about the protocol that's out there, I'm sure you're seeing that the, through the Methodist Church, the protocol for um, a grace through separation. You see that as a divergent way of coming at the world. Um, so let me just, I want to take a minute here and y'all turn to your neighbor around the table, just do it like in pairs and say, what's an example of convergence and divergence that you're seeing? How are you experiencing that in your congregation um, or in your own life? Just take a minute and talk to one another in pairs or make a three if you've got an uneven number at the table. Where, where are you seeing that? We're just gonna take five minutes here, go. Have the chance to just think about these and how you're experiencing that. So let me move to our second trend Um, so let me move to our second trend up here, which is the decrease in institutional affiliation. Um, and it's a sharp decrease. And that's happened in, in, in our lifetimes, in my lifetime. Um, in um, the last part of the 20th century, I mean, people um, joining or no longer joining organizations in the kind of patterns that we once did. And you, if you're a member of uh, Kiwanis, Rotary, Lions, Shriner, Bowling Leagues, um, 
any of those. They're all struggling here about, and, and the people who are a part of them are my generation and, and many of yours. Um, and, and that's because that's the world we grew up in. Again, it's a convergent world. People wanted to be together. They wanted to be joined. Mainline Protestantism in 1976, 44 years ago, mainline Protestants, which is not just Methodist, but includes, um, you know, Presbyterians, etc. We were the largest religious group in the U.S. Um, and, um, in 1976, three in 10 Americans identified as mainline Protestant, three in 10, 30% roughly. In, 19, in 2018, two, last year, two years ago, um, it was one in 10. That's the shift from three in 10 to one in 10 in um, that uh, really a pretty short period of time. Um, the Catholic Church is has its own struggles, but their numbers have been buoyed up by newcomers to the United, um, to the U.S., which are basically Hispanic. Um, and that, that same group um, is helping evangelical Protestantism. Um, but you know, of course, that the United Methodist Church has experienced a steady decline in membership and attendance um, in the U.S., and that our growth is global and it's global in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, so I just mentioned it, I know that you're aware of it, but what I hope you can hear about it, it's not just us. I mean, we spent decades saying, you know, what's wrong with us? That, that's, it's not us. <laughs> you know, what's wrong here is that it's not a wrong, it's that the culture has shifted dramatically and those of us in leadership here, we grew up and like to come together and be together. But that's not what we're seeing in these younger generations. So let me do the, th well, third trend up there. Um, I'm gonna do these last um, a couple of, uh, quickly. The third trend is the rise of the millennial generation. Um, the median age in the US today is 37. Now think about that. Look around here at the, this of us together. The median age in the U.S. is 37. For, for clergy, United Methodist clergy in the U.S., what would you guess your, collectively, your pastors, what age would you guess we are? Median age. Median age is the, you know, half or, half or older. Half. Yeah, somebody said 55. That's the right number. It's 55. It's 55, that's the median age. Um, for laity, we, um, by the ways that, you know, with, with clergy, we got your pension data, so we actually know how old our clergy are. <laughs> Um, so, but there are, you know, um, sociologists can make pretty good, demographers can make pretty good guesstimates based for laity. And so we think that, um, laity about the same age. It's about, it's about 55. See, what's happening here is that we have almost a full generation, the age discrepancy between who lives in our community and us, the United Methodists, is almost a full generation. Um, and the, um, again, let me just say, um, I say this in lots of places I go, um, congratulations to the Florida Annual Conference because y'all are trying to do something about this and have got more work going on to try to think about how do you reach millennials than any of the other conferences that I'm aware of. Um, and. How do you disciple these folks, which is not going to be the same way I was discipled. Um, and then we got Gen Z coming right along. I mean, let's, you know, we're focusing on the millennials, but Gen Z, those are our grandchildren. Um, so here's what we know about millennials that make them different, uh, that they're very comfortable with social media. They grew up in the information age. Technology is their language. When I couldn't get my computer to work right, who do I call? I call my granddaughter. Um, and when we get now to Gen Z, which will be our youngest grandchild, he'll be a Gen Z. Um, he doesn't know any other language other than screens. Um, I'll tell you, kind of, this is sort of a, um, just a smile. Um, I, I personally am not a big TV watcher, but a friend of mine told me about watching the Ellen DeGeneres show, and it featured a, 
little group of Gen Z adults. That, that means they have to be in their 20s, um, early 20s, early 20s, like 20, 21. And she said she wanted to test them on their knowledge. And so she had them look at an analog clock, you know, an analog with a face with the numbers on it. And she asked them to tell her what time it was. The Gen Z's, only 60% could read an analog clock because they've all grown up reading screens. Um, I, I, it just, you know, it's, if, if you think you're having a communication problem, it's because you are. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, and these, these millennials are in the, you know, they're most comfortable in the world of individual preference. That's how they grew up. And um, there are millennials that prefer an attractional model of ministry and traditional model of ministry. And you can think, <coughs> think of churches here, as I can in Texas, <coughs> excuse me, that, um, let me get a drink here. That have got lots and lots of young adults attending there but there are also many, many millennials that are looking for non-traditional. And that's where Fresh Expressions has been such, has been so wonderful because it's helping us think differently about dinner church, about fresh uh, um, apartment ministries. Uh, and we got Gen Z coming up and you know, we don't know what they're gonna be, you know, kind of what they're, I mean, we have some hints I mean, this is a generation that's real concerned about climate change. Think about Greta Thunberg and all the publicity that's come about her. Um, they're, the, they're the first generation to practice active shooter drills and experience mass shootings. We don't know what that's going to mean in terms of what their own personal hopes and dreams will be um, as we move forward in the future. Uh, but we know that it's going to take something different than where many of us, you know, maybe Gen Z's are going to be the change the world generation. Um, it'll be an interesting to see then how the millennials respond. So let me go to the last one here. We're seeing the rise of the spiritual, but not religious. Um, so where do the people who don't want to be affiliated, don't want to be a part of something join, and where do they go? Um, a number of years back, not that long ago, we referred to them negatively. We called them the nuns and the duns. Um, these are, the nuns were those who've never been a part of the faith community, duns were those who've been harmed in some way by their church experience and left, and they weren't joining. And, you know, we went in the United Methodist Church, you know, we've been working very hard to enlist them in through church growth efforts like New Church Starts and con congregational transformation programs that tried to focus on attracting new people to existing churches. And there are some parts of that that have worked. But we've also learned, speaking of what we need to learn, that these individuals do not describe themselves negatively as nuns and duns. And so listening to them more carefully, researchers have coined this language, spiritual but not religious. Thinking spiritual is this desire, I would say God places it in every human being, to seek connection with something beyond ourselves, with God. It's what at least the church calls God, made known in Christ and the Holy Spirit. And so these individuals who identify as spiritual but not religious, I mean, the growth of that group is dramatic, um, especially among millennials in Gen Z. By 2016, which is now four years ago, 39% you know, that's more than one in three of millennials claimed no religious affiliation. And they were prepared to say that they were spiritual, but not religious. So how we reach them and the desire to discover new ways to reach them is um, incredibly important. Let me show you a little slide here. That's what's happening in denominational affiliation. That little line. 
That's what's happening in the rise in spirituality, people saying that they um, are spiritual but not religious. And to connect with them is going to require a different kind of church and a different kind of leadership. And we're going to need to imagine you, me, all of us, new ways of communicating the faith of Jesus Christ. And I'll say more about that um, as we get into this afternoon. But kind of just, this is sort of where we are. Um, So we're going to stop here in a minute and not stop. But um, I'd like to, we're going to take about 10 minutes here and uh, and then then we'll take a break. Um, how are you experiencing all, any of these? Just pick out a shift that you want to say more about, those four trends I showed you. How, how are you all experiencing that where you are? Um, how have they impacted your work? Um, spend some time talking about, particularly focus on your congregation. What differences are you seeing from, you know, however long back you want to go um, to now? What difference is it making in your congregation? You got it? All right. I'm looking at my watch. I've got that it's 1031. So we're going to go to 1041 and give you 10 minutes here. And then we'll take a break. All right. Go. Ready, set, go. So that first session, I tried to do some presentation for sort of this is the world we're living in. Um, These are the changes that have been happening, and they're very pronounced. um, And as we think about how to communicate the gospel, um, we have to to take this into account. I mean, it's the world we live in. It's a description of reality. Um, So what I want to talk about in this next segment is a little, is talking, now how do we go about leading in a time like this? Um, so um, a, bit of, uh, a, a, a bit of history here. Um, let me pop up here. So by 1996, which is just a little less than 24 years ago, 23, we knew as Methodists that we were no longer making as much of a difference for good as we believed that God desires for the United Methodist Church to make. We weren't clear about what our own purpose was as a denomination. So in 1996, the General Conference adopted a mission statement. Now you say to yourself, what? We had no mission statement before that? Well, no. It was not in the Book of Discipline anyway. It was sort of everybody kind of had this sort of common consensus that, you know, you came to church, people joined, they were raised in the church. But in 1996, at the General Conference, we adopted um, a mission statement. And um, in in that year, we said that our purpose as a denomination, as the Church of Jesus Christ, Methodist, was to make disciples of Jesus Christ. But in that year, in, in 96, we didn't say why. Why do we make disciples of Jesus Christ? So the next general conference came along, which was in the year 2000, and we added four more words for the transformation of the world, which is what gets the, God's reign on earth as it is in heaven. Um, so we said, this is our purpose, and we have been trying now for the last um, 23 years to live into that purpose. So notice here when you look at that, the focus on the individual. We said our focus is to make disciples so that doing the work of Jesus is not primarily about church membership. It's not even about attendance. It's not about institutional leadership. It's about being a disciple of Jesus. It's about asking the question, are our lives and the lives of people in our congregations looking more and more like Jesus? Do we practice what Jesus preached in the Sermon on the Mount? Are we creating new communities like the Apostle Paul? Are we changing the world to become more like the world that Jesus talked about? Um, 
And it means that we're struggling in new ways with the question that John Wesley asked the early Methodist, do you expect to be made perfect in love in this life and are you earnestly striving after it? So we're trying to, these are the, these are the focus here for what is our purpose. So as my baby boomer generation passes away, retires, passes away, moves away from leadership, and millennials and Gen Zs are becoming a larger and larger percentage of the population, they're stepping into leadership. And one of the interesting things we saw in the elections for general conference this time, for the first time, we saw the youngest, this is across the U.S., um, we saw the youngest delegation in decades, and we have the highest percentage of new people being elected to general conference than we've seen in my lifetime. Um, so when we see this younger group coming in um, and lots of new people, it means that likely they're likely to be more divergent because that's their generation and more tolerant of differences. So I think we, it's a new day um, for the United Methodist Church and for the people of God. So Dr. Susan Beaumont gives us this beautiful image of the changes occurring in our time, this threshold time, the time with what we have been and what we shall be, and she refers to it as liminal time a threshold time. The word liminal comes from the Latin word that means threshold. You're lev you've left one, but you're not yet in the other one. And she describes this liminal season, a threshold time, you can see it on the screen, a quality of ambiguity and disorientation that occurs in these transitory, fairly brief, um, situations and spaces when a person or a group of people is betwixt and between one thing that has ended and another thing that has not yet begun. And this seems to me at least that there are many, um, it's, we can describe many things about what's going on in the culture around us that are betwixt and between. <laughs> it's, it's not where we were, but it's not where we're going to be. So when we're in this sort of betwixt and between position, um, it's a challenge because it's characterized by uncertainty um, and by apprehension. Both those things, that's part of it, uncertainty and apprehension. And on the other side, it's characterized by excitement and possibility. So we find ourselves caught, I mean, on the one hand, we're anxious for what is coming and at the same time maybe a little excited um, at this new thing that God um, is doing. Um, so uh, if you can for a minute um, remember the, I, I don't know, it, it, whenever you learn to ride a bike um, and remember what that's like. I mean on the one hand the first time you do it um, you get on it and um, it's exciting because this is this new thing and you got this bike for Christmas and also it's like, okay, I might fall off. I'm going to, you know, scrape my knee. Um, you could apply that to sort of anything you want. You could skiing or um, jumping off a diving board or whatever um, or some other activity. But there's, it's, you're caught between both the a little anxiousness and worry and anxiety about, uh-oh, what's going to happen, but also how much fun, what new possibilities are out there. Um, so three years ago, I went skydiving for the first time. And um, it's something I'd always wanted to do. My husband was not in favor of my doing it. And um, so anyway, I decided I was going to do it. Um, and, um, and, and, and this... Um, 
liminal space, the space between this uncertainty and apprehension and over here excitement and possibility, I, I experienced that in a whole new way. I mean, I was all excited about doing this. You go through the training, they, you know, you're hooked up to somebody else who's a professional skydiver, take you out on the plane. Th that was all great until we got about eight inches from the door. <laughs> and, and all of a sudden, I'm like, you are crazy, Janice Huey. You have lost your ever-loving mind. But you're also now strapped into this, you know, the, the person you're with. So there's no, like, turning back. And what they do is you get up to the edge because you go out. And then at the end, you know, basically, you, they, you get pushed out the door. <laughs> and, and, um, and, and, and so, you know, it, it, it's really a wonderful experience. I mean, I'd do it again in a heartbeat, but I don't know that I'll ever, my heart was beating faster than it's ever beat before. <laughs> just as we went out and you're just falling there and then you discover, oh, this is, this is, this is really neat. And then the parachute opens and then you just float. I, that's liminal space. Are you with me when I'm, you know? And you don't have to do the skydiving thing to get it, but um, um, so, um, so here it takes, it takes um, resilience, um, courage, that when things don't work out on the bike or the skiing or the whatever it is, to get up and try again. And then we learn how to do those things slowly, usually, and then the new space is created. So what I'm suggesting here um, is that the United Methodist Church, as a denomination, we're in this liminal season, a threshold time. We're not where we came from, but we're not where we're going to be. Um, there are going to be mistakes. Not everything's going to be perfect. Um, but um, God's doing a new thing, and so... Our role in part as disciples is to, you know, imagine how we might be part of what God is doing in this new day, in this two night time, and then step toward it. Not, not to step back from it, which is, you know, be more comfortable, but to step toward it. Um, what I want to remind us of is that um, this threshold time, liminal time, is not new to the people called Methodist. During 18th century England, well, I said that. That's the one I wanted. So it's not new to the people called Methodist. Um, during 18th century, England went from, underwent an enormous social transition when it shifted from an ag agrarian-based culture to an industrial-based culture. That happened in the United States in the 19th century. And during all these years, um, Methodists on both continents provided leadership in church and in culture. Um, you know, we started schools, colleges, and universities, and that began first in England and then came across to the United States because we believed that every child could be educated and should be educated and have the prospect of a better future. Methodists built hospitals to care for the, for the sick, retirement homes to care for the old. We started community centers so that immigrants and the poor could learn skills to create better lives for themselves and their children. Methodists spoke out against injustice wherever they found it. Um, Methodists advocated for the right of women to vote and eventually to preach. And over and over again, Methodists invested in the larger community and a better future for all God's children. I recite all that. It's stuff you already know. But it's good to remember these are genes that are in our DNA. Um, that's who we are. Um, and that's who we are if you're the great generation millennials, um, if you're baby boomers like us. Um, so what does it mean for us? Uh, maybe we're a little, um, you know, out of touch on some of those genes, but they are a part of our identity. I mean, you're watching these programs, Ancestor, you know, you go get your, you people want to know who they are and what, 
who they are, and it helps us know how to go forward. That's what we can learn from our historic Wesleyan strengths. And now, how do we take those strengths, which had innovation, um, change, um, stepping forward in the liminal seasons, how might we learn from what we did a um, hundred years ago um, so that we connect today <laughs> with people in our own time, in our own place, in a season of great change. We're not the only ones who are facing all these changes. Everybody in the culture is facing these changes. And then how do we keep so focused on our purpose when around us is all this um, chaos and white water? What allows us to lead toward a hope of a better future and change? What do we have from our past that we can help us move forward. So I wanted you to take now, this, we'll just do this like five minutes again. Do a different pair if you can, so um, you get this. But here's the question, just name one thing from our Wesleyan past, one thing you know about United Methodist history, doctrine, polity, however you wanna do it, that offers guidance for today. What can you glean from something? Maybe it's something your grandmother taught you or your mother. I mean, I would probably tell a story about my grandmother. Um, what do we know from our past? Do you know personally as a disciple of Jesus that helps ground you to make the changes that are gonna have to be made to move into the culture of today? You got it? All right, talk to each other. All right, all right. So. What are, some, what are some guideposts here, some help to us as we try to move forward in a liminal time? Obviously, we want to draw on our past because we, got, we have good DNA. Methodists have good DNA. We need to claim the good part of what we know how to do. Um, so here are a couple of other. We're going to do about um, several of these. So one way to approach um, moving f ahead in... Um, our environment today, this liminal season, is move beyond problem solving and instead focus on purpose. Remember I talked about that when I opened this morning, focus on purpose. So here's the deal, when we're uncomfortable, when there are challenges in our congregations, one of our first responses is to turn to problem solving. It's because this is what we know how to do. I mean, and we know how to solve problems. So in Heifetz's language, we turn to a technical fix because again, this is what we know how to do. For example, if the air conditioner doesn't work, we know to recall the repair company. Um, if the children's Sunday school attendance is getting smaller and smaller, we say, well, maybe we need a new curriculum, maybe we need a new teacher, or if you're a layperson, you say, oh, I know, we'll just call the pastor and ask him or her to fix it. Um, and if none of that works, then we complain that, you know, Sunday school is just not that important to young parents today to get their children there. Is this familiar, anybody? <laughs> so it's what we know how to do, right? In a changing world, problem solving doesn't help. It only delays struggling with more challenging and uncomfortable questions about purpose. So clarifying God's purpose and describing in deeper and deeper detail the difference that a congregation or it could be a person is trying to make, that's what um, Heifetz would call an adaptive question. It's, it's, not, it's not a fix-it question. It's about trying to discern what God is inviting us to do. It's not a planning question. It's, again, it involves prayer, it involves thoughtfulness, it involves scripture study. It means that we um, try to listen much more deeply to God, to one another, and to the neighbors, especially the ones that we don't see. So that means we have to discover who they are. <laughs> Um, and then be engaged with them in conversation. Um, one of the other things we might do um, along this line is to change the conversation a little bit. Rather than focusing on how bad things are and decline, um, we might begin to think about, you know, what, what it is that our, not only what our congregation's purpose is, um, but what we know how to do. Um, Dr. Tim Shapiro, um, he leads the Center for Congregations in Indiana. 
and he's worked with over the last 25 years or so about 5,000 congregations um, and he says that in the past 40 years what folks like us bishops included have done we've worked really hard and actually gotten pretty good at improving the internal workings of our congregations we know how to do strategic planning we know how to do conflict management we know staff supervision um, and um, we know something about, I mean, we're now teaching that to clergy. And many of you lay people knew that already because you ran into it in what you were doing in your secular work. We now have consultants out there to help us. Of course, you have to pay for them, but I mean, they're there. Um, and so Tim Shapiro raises, the, having been a part of all this for the last 20 years, he kind of won, wonders aloud, what if congregations, instead of doing the things we know how to do and doing them better, what if we focused more on the life of the people in our communities? How might we better support faith formation of people in our communities and even in our congregations? Um, so it's a really good question to ask. How might we do, that's a discernment question. That's not a planning, solving, it's a discernment question. How might we support the faith formation of people in our congregations and in our communities? One of the things that is most core about what a church does is form people. It's, it's form people in character and in faith um, and makes a difference. Here's the way Wesley said our purpose was to go back to um, drawing on our historic strengths. And I'll quote from Wesley. I continue to dream and pray about a revival of holiness in our day that moves forth in mission and creates authentic community in which each person can be unleashed through the empowerment of the spirit to fulfill God's intention. That's the purpose I saw when I told you about visiting the churches in um, Los Angeles and um, Homeboy Industry. That's what I saw with those gang members. You know, they were God's beloved, and they were told that over. I mean, they heard that uh, again and again, and there was authentic community created so that people, um, people's lives were transformed. That's... The, this was the Jesuits, but this is also the Wesleyan movement at its best. When we think about um, 18th century England again, um, you know, Wesley would say, we start with the end in mind. The end in mind from the New Testament is God's reign on earth as it is in heaven, the prayer that Jesus taught us, or as we say in our mission statement, to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. And so the early Methodists focused on the power of the Holy Spirit to nurture new life um, for people. Um, they also, again, and this is not problem solving, this is purpose, they stress these early Methodist meetings, the importance of unlearning that which needed to be left behind um, and to move forward. So brokenness is left behind and learning holiness of life and heart is going forward. Friendship and forgiveness are key signs of God's reign. Hate, violence, injustice, cruelty, brokenness, in Wesley's mind, that's the old order. I suspect our mind as well. And so love, kindness, justice, and mercy turn that upside down, and they're crucial in shaping faithful Christian life and imagination. To focus on God's purpose means we begin with who God is, what God desires, and what God is already doing in the world. And so this this discernment, this focus on purpose, uh, invites us to imagine what does God desire for the world? And are we doing that? Um, we think about, you know, the world of God's imagination. Um, what does that world look like? That's a discernment conversation. Um, 
And a, a question related to that, where out right here in this district do you see already signs of God's reign in the world? Where's God's already at work? God is not waiting on us. Um, so God is already out here at work in the world. And so how might we align what we are doing with God's purposes? So you, you, are, are you with me in terms of kind of, this is a focus, it's not as easy as problem solving. Um, but it pushes us into a much deeper understanding of what is our calling. So the second one here, um, those were some questions I was going to ask you, but we need to keep going so I can get you out for lunch. So just, to, but this would be a fun thing for you to do. Imagine if you were to sit down with, a, with paper and markers well, how would you frame God's purposes for the world? I mean, you're all leaders, so you've read, I mean, you know. So what, what is the future you think God imagines for this part of the planet? Where do you see signs of that? So secondly, I'm going to move on. That would be a good conversation to have, and maybe we can have some pieces of it later. But um, I want to move on here and talk about the difference between public mission and private mission. Um, those of you who are reading Gil Rendell, you'll know that he talks about this as well. So what happens as institutions and organizations grow and mature over time, you know, we, it, they get, and, and the United Methodist Church in the U.S., all these individual congregations, this happens to us, that we're, it's composed of a network of people all subgroups, Sunday school classes, um, you know, teams in the church with different interests and needs based on their perspective about what's going on. And as time goes by, they don't necessarily fit real well together. Um, and that reality leads institutions sometimes to end up with two different missions or purposes and often they work at cross purposes one another. One is the public mission, one is the private mission. And I know that sounds confusing, so let me try to talk about it. Instead of talking about the church, first let me talk about public schools, because it's easier to see you know, the speck in somebody else's eye rather than the log in our own. So, so the mission of public schools is to educate children, right? Everybody would say that's the public mission. Um, to educate children. Um, and however, in addition to children, there are, in managing public schools, there are a whole lot of other constituencies. There's, you know, think about it, there's the network of um, parents, staff, teachers, administrators, school board members, taxpayers, parents, etc. So do they like all agree on how children should be educated? Not unless you live in a different world than I live in. <laughs> so while the, public while the public mission is one thing, to educate children and prepare them for citizenship or life or work or however they would frame it, um, that's not necessarily how decisions are made. They're made with these groups trying to navigate um, negotiate, um, work out um, together. Um, and so um, there'll be the taxpayers who, at least in the world where I live in, in the county where I live in, have twice defeated school bonds because they don't want taxes to be raised. Um, there are teachers um, who would prefer smaller schools than bigger schools, but those cost more money. There's the school board um, who's not, you know, really enthusiastic enough to get behind school bonds. Um, so I'm saying that so you can see the difference between public mission and private mission. You got it? How it works in schools. Okay, now just translate that over to church. Congregations have public missions and private missions. Our denomination says that our public mission is to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. Um, and every church, though, no matter how small they are, and I once pastored a church that had 21 members and um, there were 13 average attendants on Sunday morning. Every church, no matter how small, has different interest groups in it. 
So a congregation may say that its purpose is to welcome and include new people from the surrounding community. That might be its public mission. But in the private mission, almost every congregation wants to satisfy the people who are already there. And that comes first. That's the private mission. And what that mission will almost every time override attempts to make a change that would really support the public mission. Um, and if it diminishes the needs and wants and desires of the people who are already there. Um, you know, here's one of the, here's one of the um, examples from my tenure, um, I'll just say from being a district superintendent, it's also my tenure from being a pastor, um, is that we used to have in, um, in pastor parish committees once a year doing the evaluation of the pastor. We used to have, and many um, still do, say uh, eight functions of the pastor. Here are the eight things that a pastor does. There's preaching and worship, planning that, pastoral care, administration, community involvement, education. You know what I'm talking about? You'll probably have these congregations in your church. And when I was a superintendent and went around in every single time, I mean, I can't think of a single um, exception to this, community involvement was the dead last one for what, what SPR committees wanted their pastor to be engaged in. Dead last, every time. Now, if you're trying to connect with the community, does that make sense? No, because our public mission is to do that. But our private mission, it's to satisfy the constituents who are already here. Are you with me? Um, so, um, to, 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 to be aware of that in your own SPRs, in your congregation, um, and, to, and to say, here's what we say we want to do, but here's what we're really doing. How do we make the transition? What needs to change for us then to be able to do what it is that we said we want to do? Even if that means that we, um, some of our some of our current interests don't get satisfied, or at least don't get satisfied as much. Um, you know, I, I've been a part of any number of, of congregations now in which the public mission, the discussion between public mission and private uh, mission gets argued out over pews, pews. Um, has this ever happened? And maybe it's happened. Um, and so, you know, do we take the pews out? Do we leave them in? Could we move to chairs? Um, and it's almost always underneath that big argument about pews. Really, the real argument is about public mission and private mission. Are you with me? Okay, enough on that. So identifying a congregation's public mission is pretty easy, but summoning the courage and the honesty to have a conversation about private mission it is way more challenging, um, and, but it's also a helpful conversation because it opens up, you know, do we, you know, how do we, how are we going to deal with the world? All right, let's go to the next one. Oh yeah, that was my, don't you like that? My secretary found that picture. I just thought it somehow looked like that's the school board and <laughs> here are the kids and they're all, they're all happy and going, here's this, okay, enough on that, let's go to, so third one, um, <clears throat> be steady in purpose and flexible in strategy. A third help in stepping out into liminal space is to learn to keep your purpose is just absolutely of the front and center, but hey, there's almost always more than one way to get there. <laughs> Um, and, um, it, I mean, this is divergent thinking, you know, you can get somewhere, um, if you're living in a convergent world, you might, everybody might want to go on the same route, but hey, we are not in a convergent world. So no use to get in a big argument about all of that. Let's try to think about how could we arrive at our purpose from different angles and that's okay. Um, and so if you give permission for different groups, different um, individuals to go, um, it's a it's a helpful it's a helpful strategy. 
Um, and we're going to, well, let's just stop right there. How are we doing time-wise? Oh, 20 of, so that's exactly where we're. So we're going to take a few minutes here and let you all talk around the table. Um, so we'll stop at like noon, and that'll be lunch. So what biblical story most closely aligns with your congregation now? That's kind of where I started, to say what biblical story is where you are. You can't do all these questions in um, 15 minutes, so pick out one or two of them you want to talk about that makes sense for your church. What is your congregation's public mission? And then have an honest uh, conversation about what's your congregation's private mission. Ask yourself, what do you need to let go of? What's the most important thing to take with you? I, I always think about that, um, that last question as the Jacob's bones, uh, the um, question, um, Joseph's bones, sorry. The, and by that I mean, remember that, you remember the story about when the Israelites were leaving to go to the promised land? They can't take everything. The most important thing is to take Joseph's bones um, back over to the promised land. Every congregation has something that is absolutely essential to its identity that whatever else changes, you want to take it with you. Um, it's the Joseph's bones question. So um, pick out one or two of those questions, maybe three at most, and in your, con in your teams, have a conversation about that Public mission, private mission, what you let go of, what do you take with you? And we'll go till noon. Hey, ready, set, go. Do this final session. I want to talk about courage, innovation, resilience, and um, a mixed ecology. So um, these are, um, th this will be fun. This will be fun. Um, so let me, let me start with resilience. Uh, um, so ecologists, there are a lot of definitions of resilience around and, and you know, but the one that I want to work with here for a little bit has to do with this is this is the way an ecologist um, or a wildlife biologist would define resilience. The capacity of a system or enterprise to maintain its core purpose and integrity in the face of dramatically changed circumstances. Now you can see that and figure out it's not a big jump to get from that to our, the situation with um, the United Methodist Church and um, frequently with individual congregations. So let me say a little bit more about how um, resilience works in this kind of system. So think Yellowstone National Park. It's a great example, America's best ideas, Ken Burns said, um, national park system. It's an extraordinarily complex ecosystem. Um, as recently as 200 years ago, it was a pristine caldera that was home to thousands of species of birds, animals, plants, insects, and more. And then, um, um, shortly after the exploration of, for the Louisiana Purchase, um, Yellowstone and parts west um, were flooded with European Americans arriving by the thousands. And in less than 100 years, um, dozens of species of birds, animals were extinct or almost so. By 1920, fewer than um, 75 bison remained in the whole western part of the United States. Um, so today, thanks to wildlife biologists, plant and fish biologists, people management specialists, and more, Yellowstone has become one of the most remarkable stories of a resilient ecosystem in the whole world. Um, so here's what they have to do in terms of dramatically changed circumstances now. Every year, Yellowstone has four million of us people visit that park. Think about that. Four million people visiting the park annually. And yet, Yellowstone today is closer to what the first European Americans saw when they arrived 
than any time since then. Um, and that transition has happened roughly over the last 100 years, but actually more like over the last 75 or even 50. So Yellowstone today, and they work at it constantly, is maintaining its core purpose, which is to be the viable ecosystem that it is, and sustaining four million human visitors annually, every one of whom leaves some kind of mark. Um, and so I wanna suggest that we can learn from those processes. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about this. Um, some of this is kind of fun and some of this is um, maybe a little pointed. Um, my colleague Lisa Greenwood suggests that the biodiversity um, of the Earth's ecosystem is really a metaphor uh, for um, church landscape and that what's called for in our churches too um, is um, more diversity among how we uh, communicate the gospel, what our congregations look like, what kind of music we sing, the whole thing, because a healthy ecosystem adapts to the environment as it changes around it. So, um, not to go to sleep here, but I want you to see, this is a fun video. Um, I want to show you how one single change in an ecosystem can happen, when it happens, how it can change the whole ecosystem. So this is one change in a very complex ecosystem that changed the whole thing dramatically, changed the landscape. Um, and that had to do, we're gonna start with Yellowstone again, it had to do with the introduction of wolves into the Yellowstone ecosystem, um, which has now um, been 25 years ago as of last year. So we're gonna watch a little video here about how wolves change rivers. It's four minutes long. Um, it's been viewed um, 41 million times. So if some of you have seen this already, um, um, I apologize for that, although you know I'm responsible for some of those views and I like to watch it every time. So let me put this up here. Where's my wolf? There it is. <laughs> One of the most exciting scientific findings of the past half century has been the discovery of widespread trophic cascades. A trophic cascade is an ecological process which starts at the top of the food chain and tumbles all the way down to the bottom. And the classic example is what happened in the Yellowstone National Park in the United States when wolves were reintroduced in 1995. Now, we, we all know that wolves kill various species of animals, but perhaps we're slightly less aware that they give life to many others. Before the wolves turned up, they'd been absent for 70 years, that the numbers of deer, because there was nothing to hunt them, had built up and built up in the Yellowstone Park, and despite efforts by humans to control them, they'd managed to reduce much of the vegetation there to almost nothing. They'd just grazed it away. But as soon as the wolves arrived, even though they were few in number, they started to have the most remarkable effects. First, of course, they killed some of the deer, but that wasn't the major thing. Much more significantly, they radically changed the behavior of the deer. The deer started avoiding certain parts of the park, the places where they could be trapped most easily, particularly the valleys and the gorges. And immediately, those places started to regenerate. In some areas, the height of the trees quintupled in just six years. Bare valley sides quickly became forests of aspen and willow and cottonwood. And as soon as that happened, the birds started moving in. The number of songbirds and migratory birds started to increase greatly. The number of beavers started to increase because beavers like to, to eat the trees. And beavers, like wolves, are ecosystem engineers. They create niches for other species. And the dams they built in the rivers uh, provided habitats for otters and muskrats and ducks and fish and reptiles and amphibians. The wolves killed coyotes 
And as a result of that, the number of rabbits and mice began to rise, which meant more hawks, more weasels, more foxes, more badgers. Ravens and bald eagles came down to feed on the carrion that the wolves had left. Bears fed in it too, and their population began to rise as well, partly also because there were more berries growing on the regenerating shrubs. And the bears reinforced the impact of the wolves by killing some of the calves of the deer. But here's where it gets really interesting. The wolves changed the behavior of the rivers. They began to meander less. There was less erosion. The channels narrowed. More pools formed. More riffle sections, all of which were great for wildlife habitats. The rivers changed in response to the wolves. And the reason was that the regenerating forests stabilized the banks so that they collapsed less often, so that the rivers became more fixed in their course. Similarly, by driving the deer out of some places and the vegetation recovering on the valley sides, there was a soil erosion because the vegetation stabilized that as well. So the wolves, small in number, transform not just the ecosystem of the Yellowstone National Park, this huge area of land, but also its physical geography. Thank you for trying. Thank you for making it work. You know, it's it's with the pictures Search it makes a lot more sense than me standing vacation? up here and telling find you the story. Um, millions of chalets but to now, find your family the here's where I want to go with that well, and let fire. you have some conversation about it quickly town. here. From and that is, to chalets, think about travel your together, ecosystem in, in your church. <laughs> you know, what needs to be introduced um, into your system? What's missing? And My name is Steve. I'm a heart transplant you. recipient. Um, what needs to I be introduced into your congregation? Me, uh, and he said, read this every night, and then 30 days, resilient. give me a call back. And remember that On what I told you at the beginning, the this was highly controversial. And um, anything you introduce, or almost anything you introduce, into your system, into the environment of the congregation, that's that big a change is also likely to be controversial. And not everything you do is obviously gonna have this kind of effect. So part of it is discerning what needs to be introduced, how does it need to be introduced. What, that'll take some discernment, courage, and then um, in this case, um, the, you know, the changes were very, very rapid, but who knows if they'll be rapid um, in um, other things. So. Let me just give you a minute with your folks around the table. We'll just take like five minutes or so um, to just brainstorm. They're not going to make a decision here today about what needs to be introduced, but just brainstorm for a minute. When you think about, is there something that needs to be reintroduced that once was there? Wolves were once a part of Yellowstone. I mean, they've only been gone since the 1920s, but that's like 100 years. So um, that's a reintroduction or it could be an introduction um, that might need to be. So think in term, think big and just brainstorm. You know, you're not gonna make a decision today, but think about what needs to be, what might need to be brought into the system to help it be um, more fruitful and to accomplish the purpose of your church, um, the purpose that God intends for it. You got it? Okay, we'll just do like three minutes on this. <clears throat> so what we know about resilient systems, whether it's an ecosystem that's biological or an, an, a resilient ecosystem in a congregation, is that those systems can encounter um, unforeseen shocks or threats. They adapt, they maintain their core purpose, and they put themselves back together again. They may be a little different, but they figure out how to put themselves back together again. Um, the opposite of a resilient system is a fragile system. 
a fragile system, and those are ones that are damaged by shocks. For example, the largest giver in a congregation dies, and 20% of the budget came from her. That's a shock to the system. A fragile system will be undone by that. A resilient system will figure out what to do next. Um, it happens at the conference level. I mean, this is one of the, the dangers of what lies ahead for the whole denomination is that, you know, a number of very large churches who financially have supported the annual conference disaffiliate and the annual conference is trying to maintain its um, balance um, with those who are left. But, you know, if it's a resilient system, it can sustain the shocks and some would say even benefit them because once you, once you um, have a shock and you recover from it, it's just like with a human being, you say, oh, we figured that out. We can figure it out again. So you think about it, kind of, you know, y'all are hurricane prone around here, um, just like Texas Conference was for me. I mean, there are congregations that say, hey, we know that hurricanes come, this is where we live, so what we have to do is put the pieces in place so when it comes, we'll be ready. I mean, that's a resilient system, ready to go. But what I wanna suggest is that in the United Methodist Church, unfortunately, we've created in many places a system that is more fragile than it is resilient. Um, and I'll use an example from the Texas Annual Conference where I served for 12 years, and it's true in the Rio, Texas Conference where I live now. In those conferences, I visited many, many, many churches that have not changed very much in the last 50 years, except that their members got older. And so what happened is that year over year, they became more fragile. So I see heads nodding. So you got to know what, and you must know what I'm talking about. So how do we go about making some of these changes, which is, this is hard. This is hard. Um, how do we go about making the changes to make us more resilient? I want to lift up two qualities. Let's see if I can make this get on my slide again. There we go. I want to lift up two qualities um, of the spirit that I think are required to make the changes that have to be made. Um, the first is humility. Uh, humility is required because we don't know what we don't know. <laughs> and um, we know we have to learn, we have to, and we have to try to figure out it means we have to go outside our comfort zones, and usually it means we have to leave our buildings in order to connect with new people. So I don't necessarily mean you have to leave them all together, like sell them. I'm just talking about if people were going to come to your building, they would have been here, and they're not. So how do we go outside our spaces? That's one of the huge pieces of fresh expression that helps us think differently. Um, and uh, it, it's also true we need humility because there are going to be failures in what we do. Um, and that's why I told you earlier at TMF we say um, fail fast, fail often. Because we tend, everybody tends to learn more from our failures, like I will not touch that hot stove again, um, than by our successes. It's how we learn. The other thing we need, um, the other quality of the spirit we need is courage. And courage is required because we have to be willing to challenge the prevailing consensus in our congregations that somehow doing the same thing over and over and over and over and over again will magically get better. Um, and so we have to have the courage to be willing to move forward to where we believe God is leading. And um, it, another way to say that is that we have to be more afraid of not accomplishing what God is asking us to do and transforming communities and our lives than to be afraid of our own anxiety and the anxiety of um, our friends and colleagues in the church. Um, and so we have to be willing to find the courage to ask disturbing questions of ourselves 
um, and then to experiment, to tolerate failure, tolerate loss, figure out what we need to do next, what did we learn, um, and then move forward. Um, so as a reminder, that's what it means to live in a lineal space. Um, one of the people that's helpful to me in thinking about this spiritually is Father Richard Rohr. I'm sure many of you know who he is and that um, this is the way he describes kind of where we are. Transformation more often happens not when something new begins, but when something old falls apart. And that's when we're willing to take the risks um, to do um, what has to be done. So I want to move here in this closing part by describing what we at TMF believe is the emerging landscape of the United Methodist Church. And it's what my colleague Lisa Greenwood refers to as mixed ecology of church. And she's using this biodiversity metaphor like Yellowstone or Florida as a metaphor for the kind of diverse expressions in the UMC. And this diverse um, expressions that, and I'll say more about each one of those in a minute, this has been occurring over a number of years. I mean, it didn't just start yesterday, but what's happening that we see is an acceleration of the process because of networking and technology. And my friends, you in this district are a big part of that. So thank you for the fourth time. Um, it's really important. Um, so the diversity comes in the point of missional churches, that missional model. You see, we tried to come up with little icons here. It's, um, they're not perfect, but they're, we're trying to at least get um, part of that. Um, it has to do with not profit, innovative faith communities, and so on. The, it's not these are simply, they're, they're part of a whole. None of these individually is the whole, but each are a part of the whole. But what we have been for the last 50 years, we have been, all, we have been so um, dependent on the attractional model that we haven't built up some of these others, um, which is where we're going to need to go now. At least that's what we believe. Um, so let me talk about each one of them. You all, everybody here knows what an attractional model church is. And they're the, they're the ones that have been formed and shaped our traditional understandings of discipleship and church growth. I spoke about those a little bit earlier. And their strategic uh, mission, you know, their worship, their discipleship, small groups, Sunday school, um, age level ministries, caring ministries, and so on. And these churches tend to measure success um, um, in traditional measures which is the year-end report of the Methodist Church. So we're talking about what's your worship attendance, what's your giving, what, who, how many professions of faith, how many people in small groups. Um, these attractional model churches, the most vital of them, will continue to thrive in the new landscape. And they'll continue to thrive because they're going to attract the people who want to affiliate. And they're... You know, as we talked about earlier, not everybody wants to affiliate, but there's still a lot that do. Um, and so the best of these attractional model churches will even attract a certain portion, um, a certain segment of those who are unaffiliated because of some particular ministry that they are able to do. And we know we need vital traditional churches that are constantly seeking ways to be relevant in our changing world. And you have got those in this district and all over the Florida Annual Conference. We also have these uh, maintenance churches. And this is an attractional model doing not so well. Um, for all intents and purposes, these churches look like attractional model churches, except they're no longer attracting anyone. Um, what they are is struggling to preserve what they have left or to recapture what it used to be. These are churches in steady decline and have lost energy, vitality, and purpose. They no longer engage in conversation about purpose or identity or context, those three big questions that I put up there at the beginning. 
And um, sad to say, in the United Methodist system, we have many churches that fall in that category. To be honest, we debated whether to put a little tombstone there. Um, because, I mean, I'm, you know, these are not likely <coughs> to make it. So let's go to the missional model churches. Now, this is an interesting set, and I know that you have some of these here. These churches were likely formed and shaped by traditional understandings of discipleship and church growth. But at some point in their life cycle, they made the conscious decision to engage their neighborhood and their community in a way that redefines how the church understood itself and its role. And so their um, strategic ministries are shaped by gifts, assets, wisdom, um, needs, and talents of the context. That is, who lives there, who's in the neighborhood. And so they have usually wonderful worship, small groups, mission, but they look different from a typical um, attractional church because they often have many more diverse voices and they tend to have more creative settings and formats. They're struggling to figure out how do we measure, how do we know that we're doing the right thing? Um, and I'll give you an example from Houston since it's an area that I know well. St. Luke United Methodist Church is a an attractional model church that does its work extraordinarily well. And it's downtown, you know, it's in the downtown neighborhood area of Houston. It's wonderful, it has everything it could ask for and lots of resources. About 10 years ago now, they knew that they were reaching their immediate neighborhood counted in miles, but that they were not reaching and connecting um, with the Houston all of the Houston context. And so they ended up merging, if you will, um, with the um, Gethsemane United Methodist Church, which is in one of the areas of Houston that is a changing neighborhood um, in every single way. Has the poorest schools in um, the Houston school system. Um, many of the people who live there um, are immigrants are maybe first generation. Um, and so Gethsemane Church, which was an all white church, um, and it still had about, I don't know, 160 in worship attendance. Um, they were there, but everyone who was coming to that church on Sunday morning drove in from some other place. No one lived any longer in the neighborhood. And so they, um, they agreed, so this is like this giant church with 4,000 members is merging with this church that has 160 on them. I mean, this really means that smaller church understood it was given over control of everything um, to the larger church, which was a huge, huge decision for them. Um, and um, so I'll fast forward to today. At Gethsemane, and it's taken, it's, they've been at it 10 years now, um, finally the worship attendance is actually going up um, after it went down for a good while. But the worship bulletin today is printed in Spanish, in English, and in Swahili. That's who lives there. Um, it supports, um, out of that Gethsemane campus, uh, a gang intervention ministry that is built off of the one in Los Angeles. And right now, even in the midst of all this whitewater going on in the United Methodist Church, they have managed to raise, I don't know, $3 million, and they're replacing the old educational building with a state-of-the-art preschool that will be for only the children of that neighborhood. So you can't drive your kid in um, from, you know, a very, very nice neighborhood you are doing there. That's what we would call, that is a, a mature missional model church. I mean, remember I told you that they've been at this 10 years now. So um, that's what we mean by that. So let me jump down to innovative faith communities. So these are faith communities that are formed in new and fresh ways but their goal is still very much to make disciples of Jesus Christ. So their ministries vary widely, but they tend to include uh, a variation of gathering and worship of some kind, 
they tend to have small groups, um, faith developments with accountability, with community building, hands-on missions. These, these communities are set up to appeal to those you know, who might describe themselves as spiritual but not religious. But they're communities that, for people seeking meaning and purpose in communities, and are not likely to join any local church. Um, and it's hard to describe them, um, and they don't know how to measure success. They're trying to figure out funding models. They don't fit in our systems very well. And if they get too close into the system, then, you know, they find themselves at, you know, kind of in opposition with it because you know, then how do you how do you have pastoral leadership that has that vision? But there are all there are a number of examples of these. I mean, if I knew Florida better, I would know more there. But I can tell you that Union Coffee House in Dallas would be an example of that. And that's a that's a church that's um, an innovative faith community started over near SMU, um, and it was built around the coffee house model with they actually sell coffee it's not giving it away they sell coffee they so they have a little income from that and while their worship attendance i don't think has ever been any larger than maybe 35 um, they are s more um, young people are going to seminary out of that innovative faith community than the largest church in dallas um, many times over so what's happening is those folks are going deep and it's been a place now has a reputation for a call into ministry. Another one of those is very similar to what you all would call um, dinner church here. We have a gastro church in Houston. There's a simple church in Massachusetts, but they're all these, they tend to be smaller where everybody knows everybody, but they tend to go deep. Um, then we get into these faith-based not-for-profits um, who actually, they're faith-based not-for-profits that, profits that don't engage in disciple making. They're social service groups and they have their own place. That's not what I'm talking about. Um, you know, those would be um, schools, hospitals, community centers, more. Um, but we are seeing now nonprofits that are developing which actually engage in disciple making. That, that's part of their purpose is to make disciples. And typically they're formed um, to create a particular, to respond to a particular concern um, or need. And they, um, they, their structure is all over the place. Um, but what they try to do is purpose. So example, again, going back to Houston, just because it's an area I know. Um, so there's um, Iconoclast, um, which um, works with um, um, at-risk young people through the public school system of Houston, um, helping them learn to write. These tend to be um, kids who are African-American, who are Hispanic, and lots of immigrants to help them um, learn. It's, it's a pretty major project. Curate deals with race and people learning to talk to each other across racial lines. Um, and then this last one is the spiritual but not religious. Um, you can see that we've struggled with naming this. Um, spiritual but not religious meaning making communities. <laughs> It's a, I mean, it's more descriptive than a real name, but we're trying to describe what we see out there. And if you wanted to read about that, there's been some studies that have been done on that. It's about, you know, what the church is might be in a new landscape. And Angie Thurston, Casper Turkul from Harvard um, have done some research and work on this. And so you can go online and read about how we gather in something more. So, I mean, these are all out there and there's more of them. And they're, we're trying to connect um, and we're all learning from each other. You don't have to anymore with technology, you don't have to just invent it. You can learn from what other people are doing actually fairly easy. So um, anyway, those are, those are things we see out there. Um, so let me um, just end with this and then let you end with a conversation. 
So um, these are five directions that I think, um, and, and you will have heard several of them already today. <clears throat> One, of course, is focus on God's purpose for your church. What is the difference God is calling you to make now in this context? Second one, to whom is God calling you to be a neighbor now? Um, and who are you? Again, think about what biblical story. Remember, this is those questions I asked you earlier. What is the biblical story? What do you need to take with you? What's your public mission? What's your private mission? I mean, these are all clarifying um, who is God calling you to be now. Um, <clears throat> number four, we haven't talked about, um, but I, I put it up here because it's too important not to mention, and it is <clears throat> to think both and and not either or. Um, we said this earlier, we are in a highly polarized culture from my point of view right now, and so we tend to want to do either this or that, and you can pick any number of examples for yourself about, okay, do this or that. Um, what we're saying here is think both and. So think divergent and convergent. And that's, what, remember, the little pendulum thing is I put in the middle because we really need both. Um, it's, not, it's not accurate to say that we, all like, we are all alike because we're not. But on the other hand, it's not all about me either. So that's, that's how we're trying to, so think both and, and that means think attractional and missional. Don't, you know, nobody's saying shut down attractional model churches, but think about how you can be not only attractional, but how can you be missional? How do you get out um, into the communities? Uh, again, I'll go back to remind us, you guys are Methodist, I'm a Methodist, you're a Methodist. Methodists have worked on both and thinking for a long time. John Wesley held together justification and sanctification, evangelism and social action. We are not, in our DNA, we're not either or people. We are both and people. Um, and so it's that both and approach that helps us um, keep going there. And then finally, finally, um, innovate, experiment, and keep learning. Uh, there's probably nothing more important than that. Um, and so, um, you know, it's, it's really important that we continue to move on out. Um, you know, I, I think that a Wesleyan understand, this is why I think the UMC is positioned better than most mainline Protestants to go forward, because we have a way of thinking that holds together both the wisdom of the past and a radical openness to change as we go forward. Um, Greg Jones likes to call that traditioned innovation. And it's a nice phrase because you're taken what's best from the past. Um, and that's why we've done these little exercises about, you know, what would you take with you? So you take the best from the past, but there is an openness to this new world that God is calling us toward. Um, so we have to imagine what God um, is asking for us, take risks, study scripture, um, and then you just gather all the courage you can muster. <laughs> and step out there and try something new. And if it's a success, great, learn from that. And if it's a failure, learn more from that. Um, and then try again. Um, that's what that's about. So let me close and just um, let me give you a chance. I think I put these, yeah, there we go. So last conversation here. Um, what is standing in the way of you getting out, take, stepping forward and trying at least one thing new, whether it's a fresh expression, a missional innovation, what's stopping you and your church from trying something new? Um, how could you, if you can't do it as a congregation, do you have a group of people in your church that can step forward, are willing to step forward? And if they did, how would you support them? Um, you know, think about, have you, got, have you got a couple of three, four, five, ten folks who want to try something new? Uh, then how would you encourage them? If you are not the one that wants to, um, 
instead of saying, don't do that, what can you do to be supportive? Are you with me? Okay, let's take, um, let's take about, oh, maybe six, seven minutes here, and then we'll close. Um, so um, go to it. What's standing in the way of innovation in your church? So, oh. Renz, I, I, I want to just do a quick close by saying, um, I'm, you know, after all this, see, I'm very, very hopeful about the future of the United Methodist Church um, and for reasons that you've heard here. But before we totally end, um, what, what I'd like to do, we've got maybe 15 minutes here, maybe a shade longer if we need to. Um, I'd love to hear from you. I mean, y'all have been a wonderfully attentive group of folks. And, you know, I, we, we, I had, you know, you were talking around your tables, but uh, we've got, a, um, June's got a, and um, microphones. I'd love to hear, um, is there a particular insight or learning that stands out for you today? Something that makes you think of? Or conversely, is there a question about, you know, what we've had conversation about today that you would want to ask me? Either, either way, sort of something you've learned and a kind of a take home um, or um, something um, that you want to ask about. Um, so, hey, the floor is open. Um, questions or comments, either one or both. Check, check. Oh. I'm on. I'm on. Okay. Sarah, thank um, you. My comment, uh, my takeaway, big takeaway from today is to put aside any personal feelings I have about changes that we're going through and to try to focus my attention on what God wants from our church. Not what I want, but what God is expecting the United Methodist Church to do going forward and, and pray about that and make that my focus. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Others? Hi, question. How do we move how do we move beyond fear? Fear of the unknown, fear of what a new worship looks like, a new expression. Like how do we get beyond that fear? I guess that's the question I have. Um, the best way I know to answer that is just to quote scripture. I mean perfect love casts out fear. And I would say that, you know, it you gotta love more than you're afraid. <laughs> and um, that's hard. I get that. Um, but um, to me, in almost every way, um, you know, love is the antidote um, to fear. And, um, and so we have to figure out, and that's sort of the discernment, you know, how do we, how can we show love, express love, be love in our person? Um, and that... I don't think it ever makes fear go away, per se. It's not that I don't, you know, have anxiety in the pit of my stomach. It's that I move forward anyway. Um, and that's probably true for y'all. Yeah. Fail fast, fail often. <laughs> Get up, dust yourself off, and move forward. Yeah. Thank that's you. my takeaway. That's your takeaway. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Others? Let's come. Sarah, where'd you go? Right there. Good morning. We shouldn't let uh, traditional ways of interpreting the Bible keep us from moving forward. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm from Inverness United Methodist Church, and we have started what you call Messy Church. And you've probably heard of it. I have. It's... And it's awesome. We are in our second month of doing it. And uh, it is the most fun thing I have ever seen. And we've had a wonderful turnout with the parents and children that are coming to it. And we're getting feedback from the children and the parents now, which is just awesome. It's an answer to God, what God wants us to do to bring the young people into the church. And I do want to say another thing, and what the lady said about fear, 
I was told one time by somebody that's in this room, um, a pastor, and she said that, and she tries, tried a lot of things. She said, what you got to do is throw it against the wall and see what sticks. <laughs> <laughs> hey, quick, quick, quick follow-up question on that. How many of the people that come to your messy church were connected in the life of your church before you started the messy church? Only a couple through people that have been coming. They brought their grandchildren, but the rest of the people have been invited and we've uh, been advertising and it's bringing the people and the parents in the community. We had one gal that came, sat in, at our table because we served dinner at first. The first thing we do is serve dinner to them. And she said, I didn't come to the last one you had because I'm tired when I get off work. I stand on my feet all day long and I have a hard time getting here. But she said, I found out I didn't have to fix dinner. I could come here right from daycare and sit down and let somebody else wait on me. And that's what we try to do is take care of the parents. Servant well. ministry. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Sarah went about right back over in that corner. Good afternoon. In my travels, I found out that in order to gather young people, they like animals. We can do dogs and cats and horses. There's a great need for horses and there's a great demand for horses. So if we give those lessons at our church, we can get those kids to come get the lessons from that. And then they have to do the equipment. Is another thing our young boys love to operate. And we can get those and utilize it right. We can bring those young people into our church through that. And there are farms and people that will work with you with those animals to help do this, to get our kids out of trouble and to keep them off of the drugs. Because I was at a farm once that we had this program going and the people died that would kill the program. But I would love to see it fulfilled again. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I sense a new ministry here, pet ministry. All right. Um, from your point of view, how do you balance caring for some of the anxiety that liminal seasons can create with also challenging people to lean into that and not let that paralyze them from taking action and innovating? Like, how do you balance the two? Um, sometimes well, sometimes not so well. <laughs> but, but in terms of well, I think, again, it's keeping focused on purpose and, um, and staying grounded in scripture and in prayer and in, um, you know, people talking to each other uh, and caring for each other. Um, and, um, and, and at the same time, you know, not letting the, the desire to move forward, um, not letting that take fifth place. Um, it's got to keep going. So that's a really good question. You know, I, I will say that, you know, in my own personal life, is, um, and I think this holds true to, at least to some extent in con uh, congregations, you know, I found that there, there is a rhythm, you know, there is a time for every season. So sometimes there's a time to be a little more focused internally that has to be balanced by um, a time to be focused more externally. So I don't know that you ever walk a tightrope and you know it's perfect both times, but there is this sense, um, and it's true in scripture, I mean, of this um, you know, turning one way and then the other. Um, so that's, uh, um, I mean, that's at least one um, baby boomer's response. <laughs> Anybody else here? Oh, yeah. This is just more of a comment. So at Lake Pan, we don't have a church website anymore. We really don't have the budget for that. So well, I was staying away from our innovation. So what we did, we began doing social media as a presence. And one thing we started doing, we started getting a Facebook page, a Twitter page, and we're trying to find so many interactive ways whether it's doing memes or anything that's fun. And then what we started doing, I kind of got piggybacked off Reverend Beck right here. 
he always would say in the, his um, contemporary one, get your phones out, do Snapchat, do whatever you want. And so it's about that social media connection. That's possibly one of the best ways to get people my age in the church. If you have a strong social media presence, because I can guarantee we will not visit the church website if there's a Facebook page, if it's Snapchat, Twitter, if there's anything else. Because really the website's just to us some old archaic thing. <laughs> <laughs> no offense, I'm sure we have really spoken, good websites. Spoken like a millennial or a <laughs> Gen Z. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Hey, for, oh, here we go. We got a question here or a comment. To reiterate this lady's comment over here about fear. When I was a teenager in high school, report day or speech day would come along, I'd think to myself, can I die now? <laughs> Scared to death, hated it. But then as I got older and singing in quartets and choirs and all this stuff, I overcome that fear. Now it's hard to keep me away. The thing is, you just have to push through that fear and do it. Do the thing you fear and the death of fear is certain. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, and while we're chatting here, I assume all of you um, um, know um, Michael Beck's book here, um, Deep Roots and Wild Branches. But if you don't know it, this is a book well worth your reading. I mean, I give it away. We have a stack of them at TMF and um, try to hand them out as an encouragement and support um, to people um, who are, you know, just kind of on the edge, want to learn a little, maybe they're not ready to make the big jump off the high diving board, but, but they're thinking um, and this helps them um, put, put some structure around it and it's also just a huge encouragement. So um, thank you for writing this book and thank if you haven't, if you yourselves haven't seen it or read it, this is, this is worth a read, absolutely, big help. Deep Roots, Wild Branches. And they're for sale. Look, back on that table? All right, thank you. They're for sale back there. So, you know, I talked today about both and thinking. You've got it on the front cover of this. You know, it's not just about deep roots, and you wouldn't have wild branches. So you've got, it's, it's you know, this whole piece is um, who we are. Anyway, for sale back there. Um, other um, questions or comments? Well, again, I'm like super hopeful for the United Methodist Church. I know we're in a whitewater time. I feel it myself. Um, feels um, it's scary, but it's also, you know, a time that, you know, I believe that God is with us and that God will lead us through this. Um, and I would just uh, encourage you all, which you already are, um, to stay focused on purpose, um, figure out who our neighbors are, reach out to our neighbors, um, learn, um, and pray. Um, pray for your congregation, pray for this annual conference, pray for the United Methodist Church, and um, pray for Christ Church around the world um, as a part. That's a, Again, borrowing from our heritage um, and who we are as good Methodist people. And thank you, thank you, thank you for your hospitality today. Thank you.